Um, we're, we're delighted to be here. It's always exciting to get out of uh, the middle of nowhere to uh, fanta fantastic big cities. And uh, thank you particularly to the United States Embassy. Um, they've provided us with a fantastic hotel room that has a jacuzzi and a heart-shaped bed and a hot tub. So really, really money fantastically well spent. <coughs> go, go girl, right? Huh? Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, you'll have to get used to the jokes and the innuendo tonight. This won't be your usual boring architecture lecture, all right? Um, I, uh, I've worked in Hale County for 17 years for my sins. Um, hopefully, uh, there's been plenty of fairly horrible movies and videos and things made about the Rural Studio. There's actually a, an excellent book recently came out, Rural Studio at 20. Myself and Eleanor did it, so if you want to get real, get, get the dish, the dirt on the Rural Studio, go ahead and buy that. Um, but um, I hope tonight I can show you a little bit a sort of insider's perspective on it. Um, I, um, um, I think I'm, I'm most proud that um, we have actually challenged designers to, to come to a place where designers don't normally set foot. And I'm not, I'm not certain whether they simply avoid these kinds of banal challenges or everyday challenges, but I think um, uh, typically designers are not confronted with the challenges that we've faced. And I think I'm, I'm very proud of that fact. Um, everything that you're going to see tonight is designed and built by folks that are between the ages of 23, 18 and 23. Um, so when you say design build, it's not in the kind of uh, uh, conventional kind of corporate sense of the manner where a, um, an architect uh, makes a, a sketch on a napkin and then gives it to a, a builder and a contract to build it. it um, <coughs> I'm actually talking about something more, more akin to the master builder of, of bygone age where um, our, my students and, and myself and our teams are, are involved right from the very beginning and conception of the projects right to the end of the projects. So everything that you're seeing tonight, they actually do. They, they do the electric, they do the plumbing, they put the roof on, they make the foundations, they pour the concrete, you name it, they do it. And it's not that we're, we're trying to kind of um, turn, turn them into craftsmen, but it, what is fantastic about it is that they, they learn how difficult it is to do something well. And they, they kind, of get, kind of begin to understand the implications of those lines that you all draw every day, right? Just how much does a block weigh? How much does a two by four weigh? How difficult it is, you know, just the logistics of building. Um, I think uh, the other thing I think that's probably helped this program become <coughs> useful, let's put it that way, um, is we've stayed in one place for 24 years. We're coming up to our 25th anniversary. The university wants to, the, sorry, the university wants to celebrate every possible anniversary that we can, so I guess we'll be having more champagne next year. But staying in one place, we've become a neighbor. Um, I think we've, become, we've, we've begun to be understood as a resource. You all are a resource. You go into a rural community, you bring a, re you 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 bring a resource into that community. And we have, uh, we've dug our heels in. And we've, we've made lots of screw-ups, but I think, uh, and honestly, uh, we try and take responsibility for everything that we do. Um, if we screw up, we hear about it. If we don't, if if we do a good job, we really don't hear about it. It it is, um, it's it's the action of being a neighbour, right? Um, I think we're we're also, uh, in some respects, a sort of town architect. We're not a helicopter program. There's plenty of programs like this that like to fly off to some poor African country and do something and then and then leave. We actually get to confront the ugliness of whether or not what we did succeeds or fails, right? And that's a huge learning curve for us all. I, I, I don't know how many architects get that opportunity. If you, go, uh, if you go to some other country or you're designing a project for another city or another country, how do you ever know whether or not it worked, honestly? And so 
we're, we're actually uh, we're surrounded by a work. It's our work. It's in a 25-mile radius, and so we, we get to understand the impact of it. Um, I think uh, we also are, are in the privileged position of, of asking the slightly righteous question of what we should do rather than what we can do. Lots of you know, schools and, and design programs challenge you all to the, ask the question, what can we do? But we like to say, not only lay, ask what can we do, but what really should be done, right? Um, <coughs> I think uh, somebody asked me this morning, um, uh, the, the kind of the, how do I, I, I frame it for the students well, when they arrive in Hale County? Well, I, I think we simply, we put them a, a, a very small challenge. We ask them to leave it just a little bit better than they found it, right? If you can just, just make the smallest of improvements, the incy wincy baby step, step that's, that's absolutely and utterly important, right? Um, I think, <coughs> you know, uh, we, we uh, and programs like your social hub, uh, they're challenging not only to you as students, and sort of stepping off into a, into, a, into a challenge that you don't really know, that there's not a guaranteed ending, right? You'd, uh, typically in education, we like to be able to frame, we're going to do this and you're going to learn this. Well, in, in these kinds of conditions, you know, we're going to learn all sorts of things, but it's not so easy to put a frame around it. And so, you know, I think you should, you should applaud your faculty and your staff for for having the guts to kind of step out and, and sort of expose themselves, just in the manner that, that they're expecting you to sort of put yourself on the line, right? Go, go into the unknown, and, and you'll learn more from it than just sort of staying in your comfort zone. Um, I hope that uh, tonight offers a really positive critique of how we, we treat teach and train architects and even how we procure architecture but above all else I hope it I, I myself and Ellen are kind of exude the kind of uh, utter and total joy in the act of designing and building it is a privilege to do what we do to dig a hole in the ground and make a mark on this planet right it is a huge privilege that you all have so you know treat that as a precious thing um, I will, you'll, I think, as you can see, that's the kind of, the, the stuff that I need to say. Uh, so this is, this is um, where we come from. Um, this is downtown, or the city center. Um, it's, a, it's a little town of 186 people. Um, so if you drive too fast, you kind of miss it. You blink and you miss it. Um, this is the good old disunited states of Trump. Um, <coughs> our, um, she's, not listening. she's not listening, that's good. Um, uh, the Donald has actually, he's actually, uh, the, the Donald has actually do, asked us to do a fantastic big project on the southern border that's going to guarantee our existence into the future. Um, the reason I show this is uh, just to give you a little bit of a geography lesson. Um, this is the fabulous um, state of Alabama. Um, it's in what is called the Deep South. Um, as you can see, it, it pretty much gave away its most valuable piece of real estate to Florida. And um, so it's made a bunch of mistakes um, over its, in its lifetime. Um, the reason to show this is you, it, you can sort of clearly see the Appalachian Mountain Trail and the, cons the, the kind of collision of the Appalachian Mountain Trail and what used to be a prehistoric lake here Gave, gave the name of this area that we work in, which is the Black Belt. It has really beautiful black soil, or it had really beautiful black soil. Um, so it's, it's called the Black Belt, not because there's a whole bunch of black folks there, but because of this beautiful black dirt. Unfortunately, that black dirt suffered the consequences of overcultivation, monocultivation, and that, black, that beautiful black dirt is pretty much gone now. Um, this is the great state of Alabama. Um, um, one of the things I recommend if you're interested in setting up a program like Rural Studio is um, our university is on the east side of the state and the Rural Studio is on the west side of the state, almost as far apart as we can possibly get from each other. 
so that grown-ups like presidents and vice provosts and all of those folks, uh, at least they have, we have four hours to tidy up the mess before they show up, right? <laughs> and then um, um, we're in the middle of, and you know, you, uh, even if you only know a little bit about American history, we're right sort of in the, in the center of the civil rights triangle of Birmingham, Selma, and Montgomery, which is with us absolutely every day. It's a generation ago, but the impact on our lives every day and the consequences of all that, you cannot avoid. Not dissimilar to the kinds of issues that face you all, quite frankly. Um, so this is what Rural Studio looks like, a bunch of kind of fresh-faced, young, happy people, um, full of the joys of life, uh, with a grumpy old bugger with gray hair at the back, <laughs> and, uh, and his gorgeous wife. Um, we have three programs, uh, sorry, two programs, goodness. Um, <coughs> uh, we, it's an undergraduate five-year program um, of architecture, and it's a professional program. It's the only state school of architecture in Alabama, so it's a sort of very workmanlike program. Um, in the third year, they get to come out to the rural studio as a big group of between, around, let's say, around 15. They work on a, uh, on a, on a house project, or they work on our newly instigated farm project in a big group. Um, and as you can imagine, working in a big group of 15 is pretty damn miserable, and it's really tough for their teacher. Um, 15 egos that you've somehow got to get you know, going in the same line. Dan's laughing, thankfully. Somebody <laughs> laughing. Um, and then the fifth years, they do these sort of heroic um, community projects, or what sort of turned into heroic community projects, working in teams of three or four. Uh, they're, they're in the final year of school, and technically they're with us uh, for nine months. Uh, they graduate after nine months, and then um, we actually take their passports away and everything, and we don't let them leave until they're finished. So they're, um, they often can volunteer up to two to two and a half years afterwards to do the projects. And um, we as staff and faculty actually also volunteer to coach them. It's not... It's, you know, so if you compare it to a typical school of... Uh, these, these things are not being produced in nine months. You cannot build desi design and build fire stations in nine months. I'm sorry. It just it doesn't happen. So um, it, it, that's, it is a sort of the dirty little secret of the place that rely on a lot of goodwill post-graduation to make this stuff happen. Um, they get to, these students get to the, immerse themselves in, in, a, in a very small rural community. Um, it, it is a very fragile condition. I mean, there are huge questions for rural areas in the world. As, and I think, y you know, as architects, we all like to talk about cities. But I think what sadly we've forgotten to do is talk about the symbiotic relationship between rural areas and cities and that, that they should be talked about together and that there is a symbiotic relationship because the breadbasket needs to be as strong as the city, frankly. Um, so these, these represent three fragile institutions. Yes, that is a school of architecture. That's the post office and that's the mercantile store. So three, uh, what I would say, are fragile institutions. Uh, school of architecture has a very straightforward... to. In, uh, uh, attitude towards environmental issues. Um, in, in winter, you put your clothes on, and in summer, you take them off. And it's fairly straightforward, you know, not, not as stupid as we look, right? Um, upstairs, the fifth years get to learn how to use the F word. Um, that's part, a big part of their education. Um, we also, it's a building, it's a two story building in the center of the community. We uh, we deliberately kind of stuck our nose out and said, come on in, uh, come in the front door, come see what we're doing. And we have a whole bunch of public events that we, we like to allow folks into and engage with. Uh, you know, Halloween's one of those great festivals in, in the United States. We do pumpkin carving at Halloween. The locals come and carve pumpkins. They judge our costume contests. Um, so this is, you know, a bizarre, you know, um, Goodness, what's it called? Um, Toy Story, yeah. Um, this is Toy Story trotting down Main Street in the middle of nowhere. Um, and we all, we all are happy to get dressed up. And, and, and uh, 
you know, what's really interesting is in that event, we then sit down and we talk about really serious architecture. <laughs> so this is, this is three people dressed as toilets talking about their really serious architecture project, right? <laughs> and so the, the message for us about this is that architects take themselves way too seriously. And we, you know, we like to think that the work is extremely serious, but you've got to laugh at yourselves. It's part of being humble. It's, it's an important thing that's kind of been lost in this world, that you can joke about each other and particularly about yourselves. Um, anybody that knows anything about me would be shocked to see that image. Um, and this is, uh, this is Marlon Blackwell, who uh, shows up. He comes dressed as the Grim Reaper for that review, metaphorically to scythe those poor <laughs> children as they bullshit their way through the review, right? Um, um, we also have fantastic visitors. We're, we're very lucky that um, folks have shown extraordinary interest in this place. This is a, a brilliant engineer who uh, sort of started his trade down in Texas, ended up in London. And he comes a couple of times a year, and he does these proportional modeling. Uh, he, he tests models that are built proportionally to the, the final project, and he tests them to destruction. So, we, we were always really worried about how structures are taught at architecture school. There's very little kind of intuition. You know, you get taught how to, you know, size a beam, which is no use to man nor beast, right? And what we try to do is get folk, give folks an intuitive understanding of structures. Um, and then, you know, at our 20th anniversary, being in the middle of nowhere, this guy, who's one of the most incredible architects in the world, Glenn Merkert, <coughs> came all the way from Sydney, Australia to see what we were doing. So uh, for whatever reason, this place has captured folks' imagination. Um, the rest of downtown, uh, this is the post office. Um, they've just changed the hours of the post office to four hours a day. So it's just sort of inconvenient enough that it will fail. That's fantastic. And then this is the mercantile store. Um, you'll like Henry's diet of Colt 45 and orange juice. Um, but GB actually retired from the job after 49 years and 10 months. Imagine doing, running this place for 49 years and 10 months. A goddamn institution, right? Um, and luckily, uh, a couple of young folks have taken it over and are um, doing short order cooking. And it's the only play to buy, place to buy stuff in a 10 mile radius. So it, it's an important, all of these places are important centers in our lives. And, if one fails, I think they'll all fail. So we, we kind of treasure them and, and we're worried about them. Um, it's a landscape that's really tough. We're right in the middle of Tornado Alley. Uh, that dirt that I was telling you about, that beautiful black dirt, has disappeared. And what's left behind is expansive red clay that is um, actually very difficult to build on. But lo and behold, it turns out that if you, get a, if you dig a hole, um, and then super saturate that hole with water, the water stops flowing out. And so it becomes actually a very fast and convenient way to build ponds. And, and we, so if you, if you go out tonight and you're eating catfish, the probability is that you're eating catfish from our little town in West Alabama. Um, <coughs> say again? Oh, that's right. <coughs> well, I. <coughs> <coughs> We can do a special kosher one for y'all. <laughs> um, but um, it's a tough place to make a living. Um, anybody that is working in the commercial sector is driving you know, an hour to get to work, an hour and a half to get to work. Our, what, what exists as an economy certainly started out as, as timber. They diversify into dairy and, and uh, beef. So. Uh, herds of cows, and, and most recently have gone into catfish. And it's all about diversification to try and make themselves as robust as possible. Because when one price goes down, you've got to survive with one that may be doing OK. So really tough place to work. This is Laird Cole, who's a local catfish farmer. Works like you guys cannot believe. You all think you work hard. He works harder. Um, we're surrounded by extraordinary people that have made a difference in their communities, but also around the world. This gal refused to give up her seat uh, in, in Montgomery. Um, these ga gals um, are from a little place just down the road from us called G's Bend. 
made these quilts in their own backyard, um, actually became very famous suddenly. They were kind of discovered. Um, I think their discovery was actually quite sad, but their, their, pr their, their quilts themselves are these sort of extraordinary modern works of art that they're created without any knowledge of the world of modern art whatsoever. And just really beautiful things that are made sitting in your backyard, sitting on the front porch, talking together, <coughs> and putting, putting together things that are simply what the rest of the world throws away, right? Um, this guy, um, he's, a, he's a provocateur. Uh, his name is Amos Kennedy. Um, he, uh, he does uh, letterpress printing, a kind of old-fashioned, uh, very much hands-on uh, uh, printing method. Um, he, he, on his, if you call him up and leave a message, his cell phone says, hey, I'm Amos Kennedy, a humble Negro printer. And of course, I can't call him a humble Negro printer, but um, he, he, we, we enjoy his sense of humor immensely. So some of you will get this. <laughs> Come on, gals, it's okay. You all can laugh at that one. <coughs> uh, girls are laughing, huh? Um, so um, it's, it's uh, Alabama's a tough place. Uh, I hope that tonight I'll show you a good story about Alabama. Typically, folks know the kind of stereotypical stories about Alabama. I think one of Alabama's main problems is that it's actually generally owned by folks who live outside it. Um, so. Uh, Whenever we try to uh, do something about uh, uh, real estate taxes to help with, uh, um, with schooling, uh, the kind of lobbyists put the frighteners on people. And so we're, we're sort of in a vicious cycle. The education's not great. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that we've got we've to fix or nothing's ever going to change. It is a landscape of pickup trucks and trailers, which I'll, I'll sort of talk about in a little while. Um, incredible heritage. Um, this is on a on a plantation. This is, as architects, you know, we this is a breathtaking structure, right? Fantastic cantilevering roof. Uh, building's been there 150 years. It's built out of wood. Simple lessons. Big roof to protect the base of the wall. Lift it off the ground. Uh, you can see the evidence of the African carpentry with the centre entrance to this little corn crib. Um, so we're learning every day from what's around us. The, 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 the vernacular buildings that, that the farmers make from stuff that they find around them, right? And then even the antebellum homes that sort of exist for, for particular and actually fairly dubious reasons because of the folks that were <laughs> made to build these things. But there's, there's incredible lessons to be learned from this architecture that we find. Again, they're 150 years old. They're built out of wood. But there's, you know, these, these folks managed to survive without air conditioning, right? The buildings have survived 150 years. Again, they're raised off the ground. They have fantastic porches. They have big, tall ceilings. They have um, uh, transoms to, get the, to ex expel the hot air that, that rises, right? They have narrow floor plans. I mean, I don't know why, you know, why aren't we learning from this stuff? It's right in your face and it's not rocket science, okay? So we, we try to, right? Um, so as I said before, we've done somewhere in the region of uh, between 150 and 200 projects. It depends how you kind of count them. In, in what amounts to about six counties in Alabama. Um, I think the, the reason I, I show this, um, I think um, at this moment I'd, I'd like to you know, make a... Uh, I preach a little bit about localness. Um, I, I eat local honey because it, uh, um, it helps me stay free of allergies, right? So, uh, and for, you know, for various good medical reasons, it actually works, right? But I think for us, architecture is a kind of a conversation with a place at a moment in time, right? And I think I would argue to you that the kind of the problems of the world today are pretty much simmer everywhere, but they should be dealt with locally. So if you're going to design a house in Hale County, again, or, or in, in Haifa, the problems are not dissimilar, but they should with, be dealt with with a great sensitivity and with the local resources, right? For us, that's, I, I think, you know, the management of resources, the planet's resources is 
fundamental to your survival, your kids' survival. And to this date, we've done a good job in screwing it all up. So it's up to you all to make that decision. Whether you, we in Hale County should be bringing in steel from Japan or we should be building with trees that are growing around us. And you all need to make those decisions. You are at the forefront of making those decisions and you should, you should go to sleep at night worrying about that because it's a big frickin' deal, right? No, no, no question about it. It's, it's a big deal. So a plea for the local, right? And it's also what gives places their character. You know, uh, you, my wife is from Florence, Italy, from Tuscany. Why do we all know Tuscany? Because of the fantastic food there. And it's a landscape that's kind of comes out of the production of that food, right? Again, it, that's, it's important for the kind of the, the, the local culture, the identity of places, that otherwise they're going to get lost. So uh, I'm going to take you on a quick ride in my 1966 pickup truck. This is, she's called Baby Blue. Uh, the beautiful thing about Baby Blue is that she's the same age as me. She's a damn sight prettier than I am. And lo and behold, she can actually be fixed. Everything on her can be fixed with a screwdriver, right? <laughs> you can't fix me with a screwdriver, right? <laughs> Thank God, right? So, um, uh, uh, no, I mean, you all have to qu ask the questions about built-in obsolescence. You are accepting a world where your, your printers are going to suddenly switch themselves off after eight years because somebody decided it was a good idea to make sure that you should buy a printer after another eight years. Throwing that junk away is, is going to be yours and my legacy. And I'm, I apologize for it, but somebody's got to start saying that, that that is ridiculous. You know, this, you know, I only go 10 miles in this thing, right? <laughs> but, uh, I, I, you know, I throw away culture is ridiculous. So, enough of the rant. This is, uh, we start, best house project we ever did, first house project we ever did. This has my predecessor's hands all over it. Uh, it's, it's built of straw bales. It has a great southern porch on it, a big family space at the front, uh, and then a fantastic understanding of the kind of extended family, the kind of complicated nature that is the American family today, with multiple generations living with each other. So here, the nephews and nieces run out in and out on the inside into these little kind of sleeping nooks, or little play nooks, or little wagon wheels at the back. This is what they used to live in, right? And actually, Shep, who the house was built for, actually thought, because the house was going to be built out of hay bales, that uh, uh, the pet cow might actually eat his house. So he was frightened to death of that idea. Um, the, um, and the other thing to say about this is the um, remarkably unpretentious manner that the folks occupy what, you know, they don't understand it, the sort of great works of architecture or art. They're very unpretentious. This is Alberta. I, I love this photograph of Alberta. Here's her prosthetic leg, right? And my first memory of Alberta was her sitting in her wheelchair holding the prosthetic leg and kind of controlling the nephews and nieces with it as they ran in and out of the house, right? So really kind of humble and again, laugh at themselves, right? Um, we've built a whole bunch of kind of idiosyncratic houses that again have been sort of resources at hand, resources that we've been given, thinking, you know, laterally, what can we do with this? I'm not certain that, you know, under m my tutelage, this project would have taken off, but this is a house that was built out of 75,000 hand-stacked carpet tiles. It's called Lucy's House. Um, we were given the tiles by a, 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 a big corporation called Interface. The tiles had been sat in a warehouse for uh, eight years, nearly ten years, and they were off-gassed, so we, we did everything that we could to ensure that they weren't dangerous to the occupant. But you imagine stacking them up, there are fantastic thermal and acoustical properties to this wall, right? And what we ended up doing was, this is all a steel structure that's buried inside of this. There's a big beam that runs around the top and you kind of compress that beam, post tension that beam down on top of it. Um, unfortunately, you know, this is architects for you. Um, my predecessor died in the middle of this project and sort of the team split in two. So you can see the competition going here, right? we're going to be funkier than you're going to be funky, right? And 
Uh, thankfully, the, the real funky piece is the beautiful house built of carpet, not the tornado shelter that's trying to look like it was hit by a tornado, right? <laughs> um, big family. I mean, I don't, I, I don't uh, apologize. So they, again, um, you know, thinking about this project, the kind of the, this family lived in two rooms, right? On dirt floors. And uh, I think this, this house changed their lives. They loved this house. AJ, his performance at school went through the roof because he had a, a room to himself, right? He had some privacy when he came home. So he's kind of who he was and his self-worth completely changed. The problem with a project like this is, you know, um, Lucy's sister fancies herself as a local interior decorator. And uh, so they went out and bought the most expensive kind of daytime TV furniture to kind of look like the homes that you see on TV and went back into huge debt because of that. So you can't stop folks aspiring to what you all have, right? It's important not to, to, not to stop them aspiring. Um, the, uh, more recently with the houses, we sort of got serious and said, folks, you've got to kind of walk before you can run. Uh, we are surrounded by a forest, so we really believe in building in wood. This is a house that was led by Eleanor, um, expandable courtyard house. You build the front kind of machine at the beginning, and then you build uh, pieces on the back to make a courtyard space and, and expand the house over time as necessary. The house was um, covered in, ce in cedar, as you can see. All of it, uh, take all of the trees chopped down. We chopped them down, and we also milled all of the cedar. And then the, the interior space was all scavenged from a local barn, from a, from a gal that donated the barn to us. And here's, here's Rosa Lee on a fantastic porch, sitting out kind of dominating her territory, right? Um, the, the, the third year students, alongside either doing the house or being involved with w w what you'll see later, which is the farm project, they're also asked to do individual projects. One is a, a Beaux-Arts watercolor of a, of, a, of, a, of a, well, you can see this is the building that you saw earlier. So they're kind of painstakingly asked to look at that building and understand it in, in kind of, in, in detail, you know, and, and the time nature of that project itself is really important. Then the other thing they're asked to do is actually design, uh, uh, is actually, sorry, build a piece of um, modern furniture from a great designer. So um, <coughs> obviously you can see the alto chair and the zigzag chair. And these are folks that come to our studio. They've never held a, 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 a screw gun or a saw in anger at all. And they come out after 17 weeks having built this. And we don't ask them to design it. We ask them to figure out how to build it. And it's a kind of remark that they're designing is designing the making of it. So they do bock-ups. They do. Anyway, it's a, it's a kind of fantastic exercise. Um, public projects, we just got asked to do it. And everything that we, I'm showing you tonight, we get asked to do. It, it is, it's not us inventing a problem or talking, look, we're observing and we think you need this. It is simply folks coming and saying, we'd really like a, a small public meeting space in, in, in Mason's Bend. This was built out of, uh, out of rammed earth, out of the very dirt that makes, is compact to make up the roads. On top of it, we put um, windshields from several Lake Caprice automobiles that actually have holes drilled in them. So you can actually, it turns out you can actually clamp them to a structure. And um, you know, at that time in 1999, you know, folks at architecture school were kind of obsessed with fish skins. So we did our little fish skin thing here. Um, on top of this rammed earth wall. The, the great lesson of this project, unfortunately, is it, as a community space, they can't close it up. So the kids trash it. And then who gets the blame? Rural Studios problem, or is it you know, the community leaders problem? And the community leaders, as we were talking about this morning, are out at work trying to earn a crust. So you, you, you learn by your mistakes, right? The fact that we can't close this up means that the young kids are in here graffitiing in it without really knowing that they're trashing it. And then you all show up and go, why the hell does Mason's Main Glass Chapel not look like it looks in the photographs? Well, because we screwed up, right? And, and, you know, so you learn these lessons from these projects. This is a project that's built out of 900 tires that are, are filled with dirt, covered in pink concrete. Again, an extraordinary project. There's a milking uh, parlor here. 
that the cows are brought into, you walk through that abandoned milking parlor and you enter this, this little chapel here and then over here is a ravine. So when you walk into the nave of the building, the, kind of the, 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 uh, the view falls away from you and then the pulpit hangs out over the ravine. This again was built by four students and it's an it's a extraordinary piece. Um, all of the roof was scavenged. A great story about this was that the Museum of Modern Art bought um, uh, the model of this project for $25,000 from the Rural Studio and the project only cost 18, right? So, um, so we've, uh, you know, 25 years in, we started to ask ourselves these kind of what we should questions, right? Um, and I think it's, we're, we're a small organization we're uh, a, a kind of really trying to deal with the issues that we see in front of us, not only from a kind of everyday point of view in New Bern, but, I, I, you know, issues that we are all facing around the world. Um, so um, when I arrived in Alabama, as I said, um, <coughs> Alberta was living on a, on a dirt floor. And, and I kid you not, this was the United States in 1999. What it's been replaced by are these trailer homes, and I don't know if you have these in, in Israel, but um, they're, they're sort of, they're a brilliant um, marketing product. They're, you buy them like an automobile, and the problem is, and, and, and you, uh, you can you literally, and you can get a loan like an automobile. The problem is that they kind of, they deteriorate like an automobile. So there's no equity in this, right? So people might get a $25,000 loan for this, pay it off over 30 years, end up spending $75,000 on it, and after 25 years, it's fallen into the ground. So it's sort of brilliant but criminal all at the same time. So for us, this is affordable housing where we live. It's taken the place of the shack. Unfortunately, in the shack, the shack's always had front porches. These are kind of sealed tin, tin cans that have air conditioning. So folks kind of live in two seasons. They live in the heating season and the cooling season, right? And you don't see them. They're, they're, they're inside these things. So it's, it's socially it's a problem, environmentally it's a problem, e economically it's a problem. So we said, you know, can we, can we offer an alternative? Um, so in 2005, we we did some quick numbers and we said, well, what, what if we try and design a house that is for anyone and everybody? And we came up with a number 20,000 that was sort of a, a mantra in the studio, just as a challenge to ourselves. It sort of escaped out of the studio, unfortunately. So you call something something and then suddenly with all this social media bullshit, it's out there and it's gone, right? You lost it. Um, so we said, OK. Um, Monthly mortgage, about $108 a month. This is what the poorest of the poor could afford, right? So if you're on welfare, on your own income support, this is what I can, I can afford a month out of my, survive, my to, to survive. And why not put it into a mortgage rather than throwing it away on rent? So that equates to about a $20,000 mortgage over 30 years, right? Um, now, whether or not that $20,000 mortgage exists or not, that's the bank's problem to design. But we said, OK, so if we want to hit those folks, here's what it's got to do. Um, we said we also want it to be an economic engine. So it's not just about materials. It's about someone's going to build this and bring money into the local economy. So we started, at least in terms of our little exploration, saying, Let's, what can we do for 12,000 materials? Because this is what we can control. The rest of it, labor, site costs, profit, all of that stuff, it's going to be different in Hale County to Haifa. It's going to be different in Hale County to New York City. This is less controllable. This one we can say, as a starting point, this is what we can do. So we also said we want, it, you know, we want to build it <coughs> in, in three weeks, and we want four guys to do it. So you build it in the community, by the community, for the community. The money stays in the local economy. It's an economic engine, right? Um, you know, you can see the numbers. But there, so we've, at the moment, we've done 22 tests. Uh, we, uh, we actually give these away. Uh, we give them to needy folks, and we watch, and the deal is that we can watch how they live in them, and that's it. That's the exchange, right? So we go in there, and we can do 
uh, we, we can test the conditions of the house, watch the way they live in them, etc., etc. This is, this is Dave's house. This is, uh, I, you know, these, again, these are not rocket science. It, it, this is essentially a studio space. So there's the bathroom, sleeping area, living space. Again, not rocket science. What can you do with six, six windows and two doors, you all, right? Uh, and and it's, how you, it's what you do around the window, maybe. You make a big reveal to bounce light in. You use transoms to make the space seem bigger. Um, <coughs> ceiling fans, tall ceilings, right? Because that hot air rises. So Dave, Dave never complained about having an air conditioning. In fact, the great story about Dave is he loves his wood-burning stove, and he loves wood, his wood-burning stove so much we actually caught him chopping wood in his front room. So um, <laughs> we were delighted about that. So the, the, the front room is completely and totally black, right? <coughs> um, as a converse to that one, the kind of critique of this house was you kind of have to come in the front door and walk through everything. So with this one, side entrance, um, what we call a dog trot, it's a kind of a, a vernacular form. Come in, the, come in in the middle, sleep over here, uh, live in that space. Um, so day and night spaces. Again, cross ventilation through the center. There's Mac. So all of these houses are named after the folk that they were originally given to. And then a square one, which sort of proves that uh, for the same perimeter, you can get more squared footage if it's either a circle or a square. Now, of course, we can't. It's not easy to build a circle out of wood. So this is the best and closest we could get. The plan's actually pretty great. You enter in the center and very little circulation fluff in this, in this project. You know, thinking about diagonal views to make the space feel bigger. Even the position of the ugly, the great ugly American refrigerator, which thankfully it seems you all have got in Israel as well. Um, these are things are beasts, right? And, and so we decided let's shove it up against the wall over here and bounce light off it into the space. So it doesn't screw that space up if you pull it this way. The other thing for us to consider is the ug great ugly American furniture, which we all want to put Mies van der Rohe stuff in these little cute little houses, and my God, they don't like Mies van der Rohe, right? Um, oh, and they can't afford it either, right? So, um, you know, it's a shame that schools of architecture are not seeing these sorts of questions as challenges, and, and they are, and they're, they're, I, I have the greatest admiration for my students of being interested in what seem just so utterly and totally mundane challenges. Um, this is a hand, uh, ADA, American with Dis Americans with Disabilities Act, um, Act, which means that it's handicapped accessible. So you can get into this house with a wheelchair. The idea was to camouflage the wheelchair access in the front porch so it doesn't have the stigma of somebody in being in a wheelchair. Uh, this, was, this was us doing a house that's on slab on grade. You see the rest of these houses are all lifted up on piers. This one we decided to do as a slab on grade because our critique of the slab on grade is those houses always look much smaller when they're, they're on, on, the gr on the ground. And um, so again, this was, you know, how big can we make this feel? Even, this even has a tornado shelter in its closet. Um, and now we're into two beds. So we're getting more into kind of how do you, what's the issues of family life and, and, and the kind of, the extra room that you need for a family to kind of work and exist in these houses. This is, this is Bobby's house. So I don't know uh, what this converts to for you all, but uh, this is about $25 a square foot in, uh, so what is that? In, in three times, right? <coughs> so, Ten times. <coughs> yeah, yeah. This is this is this is twenty-five dollars a square foot, uh, but it's just for materials, right? So it's just materials. So basically, what I've shown you is what you can do with a pile of sticks worth thirteen thousand dollars, right? And that's the challenge. And ironically enough, these houses all end up looking like vernacular houses of the region. And why is that so strange? Because we're using wood, and they used wood 100 years ago, and they end up came up with these same typologies. So it's not, again, it's not rocket science. We didn't deliberately aim for that vernacular. Um, this is how we dress on site. Um, <laughs> this is the first uh, public building in Newburn for 110 years, the volunteer fire department. 
um, built out of wood, much to our donors' uh, delight and disgust. Um, you know, fire station, wood, all of that thing. Um, but we figure that the fire trucks are right there, so maybe the one fire that they actually put out, right? Um, uh, again, the story of this project is very straightforward. That the houses were burning locally. The response time from other communities was ter terrifying. And what did it do? It sent up the insurance rates locally. So you hit people in the pocketbook, and they're suddenly all going, we need a volunteer fire department. And so they established a volunteer fire department, and what they needed help with was a building that would stop, would, would house those trucks, because they could get grants to get the trucks, but they needed somewhere to put them and where they wouldn't freeze. So we bring that to the table, and we say to you, you worry about the sustainability of the organization, we'll help you with the architecture, and we'll help you fundraise for the architecture. You don't worry about that. You because it doesn't matter if this firehouse exists if the fire department doesn't exist, right? It just, it's irrelevant. So they're very proud of their big trucks. I mean, we're, we're um, again, it, it, we wanted it to be a big, a, a celebratory community space of a new organization that didn't have any racial tickets on it, right? No history there at all. Um, and a big south wall that uh, the sl cedar slats allow the low winter sun in heats up the concrete and stops the trucks freezing because in rural areas of course you can't there's not a fire hydrant just there you've got to take the water to the fire so if the if the fire truck freezes everybody's screwed right um, uh, five years later we talked with the with our town mayor and he said you know can, can we work together on a town hall so uh, you know the big the big firehouse got a kind of a little sister, which is the new town hall, and we, we made a little kind of civic center in New Bern. Um, uh, the building is made out of eight inch by eight inch uh, locally milled cypress lo uh, logs. It, they come out of a swamp, so they're really resistant to, to rot and to water. Our students milled them. Um, again, this is a team of four, so everything you're seeing now is done in teams of four. Um, this. Uh, this is an illustration, actually that's Eleanor, right there. This is an illustration of us testing for our engineer whether or not the major engineering aspect of our project was going to work. So could this, what amounts to being a big old beam, could it span this distance with, and how much was it going to sag in the middle when you load it up with a bunch of doofuses, right? And to code. So, um, and then you get, you know, you get the green light from our mayor to go ahead and build. Um, so this is, this is a contemporary log cabin, right? You understand what it is. It's, very, it's not made of layers of crap. It's, it's, it's something real and has gravitas. And we were struggling to understand what to make this building of. But it's very honest. You know, it, you can see the section of the eight inch timber. All of the, all of the windows are, fr are put on the outside. The doors are put on the inside in response to the fact that a building that's 11 foot high built of this stuff, our, all of our consultants told us that that wall might actually shrink by three inches. So if you put a window there in a wall that's going to shrink three inches, what's going to happen to the window? So they look like they're kind of fancy, you know, eye candy, architects eye candy, but actually they're mounted on the face for really good reasons, right? Also, you then get to see the eight inch thick wall. So people know what it's made of. It's probably our most popular project because they really, you get it, right? I understand what this is made of. Um, that's actually looking back into downtown. So you can imagine in a place like this having a place for democracy and for the council to meet so that it's not behind closed doors and everybody can see it is important. Uh, these lovely li gals, five lovely gals came to me and said, Let's work on a, on a library. Uh, there's no after-school programs locally. Uh, no access to the internet. So use the, um, the, a new library to bring internet access to this area. So uh, they convinced these folks who have moved away to, to donate the building for a dollar a year as long as it uh, re remains as a library. So this is the old bank of New Bern, abandoned in 1936 never used since, right? And suddenly it's perfect for a library. Um, this is what we turned it into. Um, uh, two guys and two gals. Um, 
we brought the, uh, it had a, a, a fantastic safe. Uh, this is the safe door, and we demolished, actually demolished the, the safe, uh, the room of the safe, and used the bricks to make the <coughs> courtyard, and brought the door, the vault door, all the way to the front, so people going by could understand its previous history. So, and then we took the space off center and made a big grand reading room. That's really just a kind of essay in plywood, right? It's got cork floors, perforated ceilings, donated ceiling fans, and it's, it's just, it's the right size for 17,000 books we, that we decided was the right size for Newburn. Um, this is the children's reading space. Uh, we didn't get all the books on the wall at the time of this photograph, but so this is the main space, and then there's all these little rooms off the side that look out onto the courtyard. Like this space is a little garden room using all the material from the old building. And then you can see the extrusion at the back, because we couldn't fit 17,000 books in this space, and so we needed a bit of an extension, right? And then there's the courtyard made with all of the brick from the, um, from the vault. Um, we do a lot of projects in wood. This is a lamella project a bolt together structural system that we found <laughs> from in an Indi um, a manual from India and uh, we kind of liked it and there were a series of buildings in the US that we had seen that used this system so literally these are pieces that you cut and you drill and then you bolt the whole thing together um, we decided to make a jig to build it so this is a concrete grade bream or what you call in this parlance a brassima bream and you put these, you make this jig um, you put these wheels on the Brassima beam and you roll this whole thing into place, right? And then with these hydraulic jacks, you lift the whole thing up and then you build that section of structure on top of it. Then you lower it, you move it along, you lift it up and build another section. Lower it, move it along, lift it up. So you could build this thing to Mississippi, um, which we nearly did. Um, it's long, it is a new, it's the Hale County Animal Shelter. It's probably the most beautiful animal shelter in the world. It uh, has low level and high level um, natural lighting and ventilation. Um, and this is, uh, this is G.B. Woods, who found a new career um, at the animal shelter after abandoning the mercantile in Newburn. Um, the, uh, the students were challenged, another group were challenged to use that jig, because that jig was expensive. Uh, this is a boys and girls club in a, in a hellhole of a little town called Akron, Alabama. Um, <coughs> there's real problems with kids after school because kids get out of school at 3 o'clock and mum and dad don't get back until 4 and they can get in a lot of trouble so these after school programs are really essential. So this is, uh, there's a, a, a rec room and a computer cl and classroom at the back and then this is the outdoor rec space. And you can see we use that jig and tip that jig on its side to give enough space for you to shoot hoops in it, right? Um, it's pretty. Um, it's, again, it's just plywood, painted chalk walls, polygal, uh, um, <coughs> polycarbonate walls. And then, you know, the, the plywood is just pulled apart to facilitate the light fixture. Uh, just a, a nice care and detail. This gal... Um, uh, uh, she, um, two weeks before Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis, she hid Dr. King from the Ku Klux Klan in her home. Uh, this was her home. She hid him in this room for one night. The Klan were kind of circling, looking for him. It was when he was giving talks to, in the local churches that were then subsequently burnt down. There was sort of a war zone in those days. Um, so in, in the mid-90s, in the last century, um, these folks got together and established this little museum. Uh, they call it the um, uh, Black History Museum, and it celebrates that night, but it also celebrates the foot soldiers that were involved in the movement, because the movement started in rural areas. It didn't start in the cities. The real evidence of, of uh, uprising was actually in the rural areas. And so they asked us to kind of make this sustainable, all of those folks are dying off now. They're in their 80s and 90s. So they said to us, help us turn this into a self-directed uh, museum where one person can, can be in charge, one entrance, and uh, help us with some didactic panels for, for the museum itself. So we cleaned it up, gave it a paint job, 
rebuilt the porch on the front and made a glass connector to connect the two together. Um, in the back, we extruded the section, so we literally just, we just pulled it out. New concrete slabs for the new sections, and the sections go all the way up to the ceiling in the entrance and in the new gallery. Because the existing building becomes the little museum that's so small you're only going to visit it once. So what do you do? You provide a little gallery over here that rotates artists in and out so folks will go and visit this place again. And then the kind of equality of the ramp, so whether you're black, white, pink or green, you come up the same entrance way, right? This is the fritted glass with the march to Selma. Most of the folks involved with this um, in the movement were involved in the march to Selma. Um, this is the kind of archaeology of what you find when you start to take walls down and you see this beautiful textured wall. And we said, you know, wow, this is beautiful. Do you, can we leave this or would you be offended if we leave this? Does it, is it too shabby chic? And they said, no, it, we love it. You know, so we, we, we didn't, uh, you know, what is one man's art is another man's trash sometimes. And we, we wanted to be sensitive to that. This is the community space. This is the didactic panels that the students made of all of the stuff that they had. This is the new gallery. Uh, you can see the kind of cathedral ceiling. This is the opening. Uh, this, there's Teresa, all of the foot soldiers, the three students that designed and built the project with them. Um, these four um, kind of changed the game for the studio. Uh, did a, did a, a project that's about half the size of a football field for a boys and girls club in West Alabama in Greensboro. Worked with all of these community folks to make this dream come true. Um, so it it's takes a kind of agricultural vernacular and, and produces a kind of, you know, an architect's version of a big shed, right? It's a big blue whale. It can be controlled from one position, uh, essentially a big shed. The students got $200,000 in materials donations, helped with work with the community to get all of the OSB, all of the sticks, all of the ceiling fans, all of the air conditioning units donated to make this happen. So phenomenally entrepreneurial. They don't know who they shouldn't ask. They just barge in there and they ask, right? And then they figure out how to build it. This contraption they found, they used to find the, the ridge, right? And move this along. So how do four people build this thing? Uh, even d all the beams they built out of OSB, which is like a plywood. I don't know if you know what OSB is, but it's like a plywood. And uh, our engineer said, you all can build your own beams. You, know, you don't need to buy them. You don't need to make them out of steel. Just you need a lot of layers and you need a lot of nails. And so they figured out the number of nails and the, you know, and so they built a wall to make a beam and then you take the wall away and suddenly you've got this thing's there, right? So again, you have the resources, you have the time, you have the, uh, the opportunity, take it. And then they're in the epicenter of all of this just mirage of folks that are trying to make this project happen. The best thing to say about this project was that the local police chief was the president of the Boys and Girls Club because he knew how important it was to keep the kids off the streets from three till seven till mom and dad come back home, right? So, big breakout space. Um, we do, you know, this is all what you all do. This is, this is a, I'm showing these projects because these are multi-year projects. So this is a park project uh, for Perry County, Perry County, is actually the poorest county in Alabama, had no outdoor public recreational space. We were charged with reopening the space uh, that had existed 30 years ago, and this team of four were given the project, right? Um, so they, you know, it's fantastic, as you all know, to work in a team, to communicate, figure out the politics of each other, how to communicate to a, a community partner. We really don't call them clients, we call them partners, because we're all in this together, right? So here's, here's the mayor, here's the probate judge, county commissioners. These folks don't know how to look at drawings, how to talk about architecture. So you kind of get rid of all of the architect, architect lingo, the bullshit that we all learn at architecture school. And then how to, you know, how to set up the room to make sure they'll get close to the drawings. How to kind of you know, match what you say with the drawings that are on the wall. We use a lot of PowerPoints because folks kind of it's like watching TV. It can, and if you put stuff on the wall, it's often too overwhelming for them. So um, and we do a lot of rehearsing of this stuff. Um, 
the students are asked, encouraged to be on site 24 hours, seven days a week. As the, as the designer and the builder, that's the opportunity to see the space in all and the place in all seasons. So bring it back to the studio, a collection that they brought back from the studio. They make drawings to communicate with each other, not only with the community partner. Make models, again, lots of three-dimensional models. This is the brilliant, the, the kind of fantastic opportunity as the builder. You can go out on site and mock something up and go and say, wow, 17 feet up in the air, not tall enough. We need it taller, right? Um, a lot of, uh, you know, detailed drawings that we then make mock-ups of to test it. We even do fly-throughs that don't, you know, they're not patronizing, they're not, they're not blobby texture. Their trees look like cartoon trees to make sure that folks get it, right? Um, then we have folks come and review the projects on site. So really smart people can come and say, this is the wrong place, you all. You need to put it over there. Uh, entrepreneurial, again, get yourself on the front of the local newspaper. Then you get the opportunity to use some toys. Um, this is actually very interesting. The team cut down some cedar trees for this project. They realized they were throwing away all of the bark. So they used the bark to wrap the inside of the formwork for the footing. So this footing looks like it's extruded out of the ground. Then you stand around and drink beer when the local guys help you with the heavy lifting. And then it's, oh shit, it's uh, 27 feet up in the air and I've got to do it. And Andrew won't let me use a self safety harness, right? So I'm only kidding, y'all. Uh, that's the liability shot. Actually, she ended up at Harvard, so that she obviously fell off and banged her head, I guess. <laughs> um, and then, you know, this kind of, this thing of uh, the implications of the fact that you're going to build it. The team wanted to do metal on the underside, and I said, well, that's going to involve going backwards in the process. You're going to have to get stuff in, lift yourself up, put a substrate under there and then screw up the, screw the metal on, on, under the ceiling. And it's likely to oil can. And they said, well, we actually like that. Um, and so they went ahead and they did it. But that's the kind of conversations we had. They put that up. This is actually the mayor at the opening. And it's, they were right. It's beautiful, right? The borrowed light off the kind of the, 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 the water on the ground bouncing off the underside of this, beautiful. So it's a cedar platform with an aluminum roof, and the cedar platform comes up and makes benches. This is the kissing bench. There's always a, there's always a little sex in rural studio projects. <laughs> These two were caught kissing. And uh, this, is, this was Hurricane, I, uh, Hurricane Ivan that actually came through before the famous Hurricane Katrina. Took this tree out and took the end of the pavilion out. Did a hell of a lot of damage. And we, we went out there and we fixed it. We got $10,000 from FEMA to rebuild it. Um, these, these folks, the mayor liked the project so much that uh, he carried a photograph of it around in his wallet. I don't know what his wife thought about that. But, um, and he said, I, uh, we want you to do the restrooms because we've got 50,000 to build restrooms. <coughs> but the idea was to do prefabricated. And they said, we want site built and we want unique. So we, we gave them unique. Um, this is the walkway to the pavilion, so everybody, if they're infirm, can walk through a forest, right? And you enter, there's a parking lot here, and then here's the tall toilet. So there's three, I think, probably three of the most remarkable pooping experiences in the world. This is, <laughs> this is the tall toilet, the mound toilet, and the long toilet. So this is, uh, this is Dan sitting up viewing that, you know, <laughs> right, from the John. And then this is the long toilet. So this is, this is Dan's view sitting, talking to the tree here. <laughs> the only tree that will talk to Dan. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is the mound toilet that poetically dives into the septic mound. And uh, with this kind of horizontal sl slot that allows you to sit on the john and shoot the deer as they run across the... <laughs> the um, so the, um, the community had run out of money at that point of view, and we, uh, at that point, and we, we said, you know, where are we going with this? And so we all, they had desperately wanted a birding tower because it's on a migratory route. And the location for the birding tower meant that we had to get across a creek. And so we, we all kind of scuttled around and started to raise money and look for resources. The first thing to do was get across this creek 
uh, we built this little bridge that essentially is three Toblerone sections, triangulated sections with a walking surface hanging underneath it. Um, so this is, this is the engineer's sketch. We really just built the sketch. So here's the tie down, another tie down here, loads here and here, cantilever here, and then you drop the center section in just like that. Simple as that, right? And the kinds of drawings that we send to our engineers and to our fabricators when we need stuff fabricating. We built the trusses in the parking lot up the road. Uh, that's actually my other truck. And then we, then we put a, a, a trailer axle on it, as you do, right? And then we ran it down the road to the, to the location. That's the gray-haired old fart holding up the corner of the truss as it bounced up and down on the road as we went down to the site. And then our students got this huge great crane donated for the Saturday and they lifted it, the three sections into place. So there's the two outer sections and then that's the center section going in and it actually fit, can you believe, right? <laughs> and so it's a covered bridge. You have the structure hanging up in the air and then you cover it with metal. So you don't have to worry about repainting it and you don't worry, have to worry about it rotting. And there's a... a, a, a granddad and, and grandchild sitting there fishing off it. It does have a handrail now. And then there's the, this kind of question of they wanted the, the birding fraternity who apparently in the United States spend the more money, most money of any sport in the United States. They just go nuts buying what, and doing whatever they do. So looking at birds, I guess. And they wanted, they wanted these folks to come and use their hotels and said, yeah, c let's figure out a way to do a 100-foot, 30-meter birding tower. And we tried and, th you know, spent three months trying to figure it out out of wood, and then somebody showed up and said, why don't you use one of those disused fire towers that they used to watch fires? And I was like, Ugh, you know. So within a week, the kids had actually got a fire tower donated for $10. And, of course, I'm in the sh oh shit moment his students are going to work 30 meters up in the air. What are we going to do? Are we going to let them do it? And I said, you've got to go off and you've got to find yourself the best training that you can find. So they're now certified tower erectors and deconstructors. Uh, they learn on the tower in place. They had safety training. <coughs> and they took it down piece by piece. And the whole structure is brilliant. You stand on the horizontal sections to build it and to take it down. You don't need any cranes. You, it's a brilliant piece of engineering from the 1920s. It's superb. And all we did was we took it down, we regalvanized it, we changed out all the nuts and bolts, and we, re, we built um, uh, two code staircases and platforms. We put it in the ground with helical anchors, so you don't need to bring a concrete truck into a fragile condition. These things go down 25 feet into the ground, which is, what, 10 meters or something like that. Just, just wind it down into the ground. Fantastic for lateral stability. You can do it yourself. You can do it yourself with a bobcat, right? And that's it in its final location. It looks, you know, you're kind of walking through the woods and suddenly you find this thing, right? And it has this beautiful walking trail to it. I think the lovely thing about the project is there's a handrail here that if you're frightened of heights, you get on this platform, you can walk all the way to the top without ever letting go of that handrail. If you're absolutely and totally frightened, you never let go. And the other thing was finding the position at the top. It's all well and good at the ground, but if you don't find the right spot at the top. So we actually hired an 80-foot 80, 80 man lift to find the right spot to put it, right? Nearly done, honestly. Uh, so this is... Um, this is another multi-year project, 10 years in the making, still going on. This is how we found it, a place where I witnessed black parents coaching white kids and white parents coaching black kids. Um, but they were also, you know, practicing shooting at the sign, right? Um, the tennis courts were a wreck, but the organizations themselves were actually superb. And so we, we approached them. We said, can we do this in baby steps? And they said, yes. So the first thing we did was we reconfigured, that's the existing, we reconfigured all the ball fields in a hub and spoke organization. And then 10 years on, we're still going. So this is the kind of, this is what you call a community partner, right? <laughs> all right. Um, where's my Budweiser? Um, so you, you get rid of the bullshit for these guys, I can tell you. Um, 
So new gates and, 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 and identity, graphic identity, all of this stuff is hiding existing or new utility lines, new benches, new backstops. Uh, these uh, vertical culverts capture water off an existing building to flush these toilets. That's a prison toilet, so you can, you can beat it with a baseball bat and not break it, right? Um, new lights, uh, concession stand that opens and closes like a mouth. Uh, you get the joke there somewhere. This is 25, this is uh, Tony Hawk. And we talked about this project as a kind of flexible strategic plan. So we didn't come in here and on day one give them this grand master plan that's going to cost $250 million. We said, let's have something flexible that we can adapt over time. And in year four, Tony Hawk showed up and said, he's a famous skateboard dude, right? And he, he gave us $25,000 and said, here's money. And they normally use that money for a startup to get a conversation going. We bought a whole thing for $25,000, right? And it's, it's dirt that we moved into place, and it's four inches of concrete laid over the top of it. We placed all of the concrete, and the three students actually finished all the concrete themselves and became brilliant concrete finishers. Uh, this is a playground of uh, 3,000 galvanized barrels to make a big adventure playground. Uh, this was three gals and one guy, called go gals, right? Um, each of these barrels is welded together in eight places, so eight times 3,000 barrels is 24,000 welds. So these gals got pretty good at welding, and uh, the kids just go freaking nuts in this place, right? Um, this is a scout hut that we built for the local scout troop, thinnings out of the forest that kind of act as saddlebags to kind of hold the building down in big winds, uh, all locally sourced timber. Uh, these are exercise stations that were donated from uh, Alabama Department of Public Health. Normally, these little communities pour a slab of concrete and put them in the middle of a field, and everybody gets beaten to get in the heat, and we put them in the trees on these cantilevering uh, platforms. And the last project, the most recent project is, we put 150 trees in, but they're all small at the moment, and there's not enough shade in the park, so we've made three shade moments around the park that are places for benches and for water fountains and for bike racks. And we were kind of, uh, you know, we challenged ourselves to control the shade and the light in these conditions. So you knew at four o'clock where the shade was going to be and where the sun was going to be. This was all done with uh, stuff that you normally cover buildings with. It's called Al Pollock. It's a, a, plas a recycled plastic that's covered on two sides with aluminum. We folded it and made them into beams. And Al Pollock gave us $50,000 worth of materials to do it as an experiment. OK, um, Ellen is going to finish this off in, in fine fettle. She's much cuter and more interesting than I am. OK, after so much English, I thought we thought that it was good for you to have some Italian now. So if you don't understand me, don't worry. You can just follow my hands, and you'll get it. I'm sure it's m uh, my Italian is much closer to your language than his English, so I'm sure you'll be fine. Um, I'll not use as many F words, but I'll try to entertain you as much. So they, they Andrew was very uh, nice. He talked about the first two questions, left me the, the hardest one today. So I'll try to be as positive as possible, but it's a tough question, the last one. Uh, our our this this project is a long term project and we call it the farm, and it's our attempt to do what the English uh, describe as uh, uh, walk the walk and not just talk the talk. So it's uh, it's our attempt to respond to a real issue by doing ourselves uh, before asking the community to do it. Uh, if it th this is also our attempt to respond to a real problem a real question, uh, or if you wish uh, to say it more realistically, a real disaster. Because uh, in, in where we live, there is a complete lack of culture of fresh food. And if you think about you know, what an action that we do at least three times a day that can have a real impact <coughs> in the economy uh, of a <coughs> such a fragile place is eating. If you take that three actions away from the local economy, imagine what a disaster. So everything we eat in, uh, in, in the place where we work comes from everywhere else beside 
uh, beside Hale County. So it means that we every day sustain large scale food systems instead of uh, supporting local small scale food uh, producers. Um, so when I moved to Alabama, this is what I found. I found that I was uh, living in the middle of nowhere and in a very deep rural area, but my food was coming from everywhere around the United States wrapping plastic. And all the people around me, whether they were students, well-educated students, or community partners, or people just living around me, they were completely addicted, and they are completely addicted of, of uh, junk food. They you know, drive their own big cars to big grocery stores, and they go celebrate on Sunday on McDonald's. And they live this life that I kind of like to call it a sub-rural life, where you, know, you, 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 you live uh, every day in a place, but you are not really tied to the economy and to the life of the place where you live. It's like a sub suburban. It's no different than a sub-rural life. And, and uh, it's, it's disappointing, and I can't stand on it. So when I arrived there and uh, was giving me the opportunity to uh, continue the same project for, for <coughs> eight years, we all decided that was a good idea to just tackle this issue and just go and try to have uh, a solution, or at least you know, have a little bit of impact in this status quo. Um, talking about disasters and the uh, implication of this lifestyle and this way of eating in rural areas is uh, diabetes is the first, you know, kind of um, impact of this, but more, more, even more dr drastically, more um, important is to talk about what is um, the population in this part of the United States is expected to be in about 15 years. So we talk about uh, on a range of between 60 and 80 percent of population to be obese. This is this is this is not not acceptable. And us as designers, we believe that it's also our responsibility to respond to this. We can't avoid answering you know this big question. Uh, this is also a lot about uh, you know, my background and where I come from. I come from Tuscany, so the landscape where I've been grown and I. So I have been surrounded for many years. It's based on what we eat. So there's a lot of wheat because we eat a lot of spaghetti. There's a lot of grape because we drink a lot of wine. So I really wanted my students to understand <coughs> that there is an alternative, first of all. Because most of them, they don't know that there is another way to eat. So they take it for granted. They think it's the, it's the only, it's the best way to do it. When they go and celebrate you know, their birthday, they go to a, a junk food place because their grandparents took them there, their parents take them there, so they don't know that there is an alternative. So I always tell them, you know, don't eat anything that, first of all, the ingredients that is made out of, you, you don't understand what they are. So first of all, just skip everything that is obscure. Second, don't eat something that in your plate that doesn't have a landscape in your head. So eat locally and eat in season. So that was kind of the, the basis of this project. But uh, how, to, how to walk the walk? So we set up uh, for ourselves small goals. So it's a large, it's a, it's a long-term project, but it's based on small scale steps. The first one was the idea of uh, produce what we need. So we decided we wanted to produce 70% of the food that the school, the rural studio, n needs to feed uh, uh, 30 students three days a week. Second, we, and then how to do this? We are, we are, we are architects, so it was the first time we tackle an architecture, uh, agriculture project. So we ask ourselves, what do we need? Of course, the first thing you need is, la is land, and the second thing is actually you need land that is exposed to the sun. So the first thing we ask the students to do is to survey the rural studio property with this you know, in mind. And we figured out we had enough land to actually produce this 70% of the food. So we started with, uh, that is the good thing about living in a place where other people like us, they are trying this trend. They are trying to ch invert the trend. So they have been already starting to farm on a small scale. Very few, but they have been there before we started. So the first uh, suggestion they gave us was, okay, if you want to farm, if you want to produce, you need to do it and start as close as possible to where you live because growing food and growing plants in general, it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. So we set up uh, the, the core of the farm where the students live and we, we design ourselves this kind of strategic master plan that evolves year after year, but it's based on three systems. So, so there is an horticulture garden at the front. Uh, there is a rainwater collection because so the second thing you need apart the sun is water. And then uh, we also established this idea of a food forest. 
I don't know if you are familiar with the uh, food forest, but the food forest is one of the permaculture's most important permaculture strategies. And it's all based on holistic systems where human beings, plants, and animals live as one system. Anyway, this is an opportunity for us as architects to teach students uh, um, not just an ethic, but also some design strategies. So we uh, start studying other, you know, uh, designers before us that they specifically design uh, farm strategies. So it's a project for students, so they run it from seed, from planting to harvesting to cooking. Um, the real main goal is is, is behind this word that, that uh, we like to um, be self-efficient. So we, we like to stop shipping food from everywhere else, the states, and we want some eventually to barter with the locals. So the idea is to um, not to be self-sufficient. So we don't expect to produce everything we need because uh, in the aim of the rural studio, you, you have heard a lot today, uh, we want to be part of a community. So it's not the idea of produce everything we need, but it's to produce some and, and eventually barter with the locals. Big challenge for our students is this part. So it's, it's critiquing their diet. Uh, some of the guys are sitting here at the front. They've seen me for years um, uh, carrying around a pocket of, of French fries. So the big question for, my, for our students is uh, why do you eat it? What are the implications of the food that you eat every day on your body and in the environment? So asking this question, the, qu the students try to you know, kind of critique what they were eating, but they're also trying to find uh, um, a way to move forward. So what they did, they bought, you know, a Happy Meal, and they collect it and they keep it in the studio for a while. And this was to prove uh, that, for example, fries, after two years, they look the same. They feel the same. <laughs> so so if, if nobody and nothing, so if no one insect, no one animal, nothing, and, and nobody wanted to eat them after two years, and they still look alike, Think about what happened when you put that food into your, your body. So we look for alternatives. Luckily, there's this guy, Michael Pollan, uh, who helped us w with uh, defining the, the, a diet that is based on veg vegetable and meat as well, because eating meat is very much part of the culture of the um, United States, especially the young folks. So it's very hard to say, OK, let's, let's stop and, and think about it uh, without giving them, you know, still giving them a hope that meat can be part of their diet. So it's about quality, it's all about you know, which type of meat we should eat and, uh, and how should the animal be raised. The fourth goal is to understand this uh, project as a laboratory for us and for the community where we can discuss not just about you know, farming but organic farming and also passive architecture strategies. Ultimately, we are a school of architecture, we are teaching architects. So the basis of this project is to design and build uh, infrastructures that uh, are completely off the grid, so they're completely based on natural resources. Uh, another big challenge is, to, is the ground, because uh, um, the soil in this part of the state has been deployed so much by the, um, the cotton in industry and the monocultivation. So there's not much left there, nutritional-wise. So we rely on, on uh, organic matters, but we also learn from uh, some uh, predecessors, like the Indians, who figured out that actually plants can help each other growing. This is, they are called three sisters, because uh, the corn uh, grows tall, the peas uh, grow uh, along it, uh, on top of it, and then the squash keeps the, the, the soil moisture. So again, this is another one of those uh, metaphor of the project as a whole. So it's an holistic project that um, work resourcefully. Um, this is a, this this project uh, has been run <coughs> and built by third year students. So every semester, the students design and build one infrastructure. We start with small steps, small scale. So we start with uh, uh, raised beds. Raised beds are very important in these parts. Uh, because you can control the drainage and you can control the quality of the soil. And also, raising up the ground, you make it much easier to maintain it. Uh, it's qu they're, quite, they're quite successful and uh, they're also you know, good lessons for third-year students who can explore different materials to build them. 
The biggest uh, infrastructure we built for ourselves, it's a, it's a large scale greenhouse that because after a few semesters we figured out that the problem was not just uh, the soil but the problem was uh, the overheating in summer and the overwatering in the winter. So because the ground doesn't drain and when it, when it uh, rains a lot uh, there is a problem of rotting the plants. So the greenhouse uh, it was uh, um, an ideal construction or building that helped us to control the climate. So it's an infrastructure, it's completely self-efficient. Again, it's a symbol of the project as a whole. It has um, a big solar collector and a thermal mass wall. So during the day, those are barrels, drums that are fi uh, filled with water. During the day, the sun hits the solar collector, hits the water, and overnight, that uh, heat is radiated back. There is a, there is a cross ventilation in both directions and then on the north side we also use dirt to protect from the, nor from the north wind. It's quite a big infrastructure that helps us to seed plants but also to grow and uh, it's tied to the, to the landscape of the, of, the, um, of the property. So those two components were designed and built on site by students every four months. Uh, the biggest challenge was the thermal mass wall because we decided to use uh, the drums at that point, you know, the, the playground was finished, so we, we kind of had this material. We also knew a little bit how to use it, but it's still a big challenge for third year students to use a material that is not a necessarily a construction material. So to just understand how to put it together, how to make it uh, structurally sound, it's a big challenge. But on top of it, they also had to figure it out the efficiency of this building. So they work a lot on trying to understand uh, how to implement the, the heating <coughs> part of this, the heating system of the, of the building. So of course, you know, if you paint, it's th this is obvious intuitive, the black is a color, but also by the research they figured out the blue help not just about raising the temperature, but also to germinate the plants, to help germinate plants. So this is the kind of research that our students uh, are forced to be through. So they go back, you know, it's, and there is always this kind of theory, then there is some drawings, then there is on back on site to figure out the best location, and then finally ready to build. Uh, we use the same material also for foundation, so it took a long while to just go off, off the ground. It's a material that is recycled material, so again, it has that ethic that we want to spread uh, with the young students, so when they come back on fifth year, they already have in their blood. Up to the, to the top of the thermal mass, it's just uh, about welding, substantially. And then the rest was prefabricated structure, was galvanized to minimize maintenance. And in one afternoon, you know, just the seed house roof was up. So everybody really had a blast. Finally, the greenhouse was not just above the ground, but was also ready for the final cut. The rest was just repetition. Uh, the studio that I taught for uh, to uh, take the project over is, was based on four months. So the big challenge for us as teachers was like, you know, when finally the students figured out what is to be done, they leave. And then another group come and you <coughs> need to, you know, again, start again, teaching them how to weld, teaching them the attitude on site and all. So repetition is a very important thing. So this is why, you know, all the projects based on two materials or one material in two forms, if you wish. The bigger challenge architecture and structure wise has been the, the roof because uh, this is about collecting as much sun as possible. So you need to have as less structure on top of the glass as possible. So actually we were lucky to know uh, Tim McFarlane, he's an engineer in London. He does all the glass building of the Apple, the Apple stores. Um, he's a friend of us, so he was very generous to help us on the phone for many years. And he kept telling me, don't worry, don't worry, you don't need any steel on top of this one to hold the glass. You just need the uh, silicone and, and double side tape. And he was telling me on the phone and it was all so clear. And then when, you know, when the conversation was over, I was like, oh man, how? I mean, no way. So we tried to find somebody <coughs> locally who would support us on, on this and make it for us. And they were all like, what? Are you kidding me? No way. Uh, the budget, the quotes they were giving us were, you know, of the roof because they didn't really, never done it. I mean, so he came by and then we did a, he came to visit us and so we did a mock-up together. So he, he came there and we actually put a few pieces up together and he was right. It was very easy. So knowing that it's possible, then it's, uh, it's just about, you know, repeating it. Um, <coughs> So there is, there is the, junction, the junction are just bad joints, uh, just silicone and tape underneath. 
so I have to say that, yes, this project is about efficiency, it's about farming, it's about the ethic, the culture of food, but it, it, we never forgot that this is also, and most importantly, a project for architects to learn about you know, being good designers. So we never forgot about you know, details or, or the aesthetic of the architecture, the impact of the architecture on the landscape that we're built with. So when this uh, gravel will be laid around it, so this corner will completely disappear. So the students had to learn, you know, to make this happen, all the process through. So this is how we look today. Uh, it has also um, a water system that is based on, on a, a, a small scale water tower where we took off the storage part of the water tower, now we all know, and we put it underground on septic tanks. So the water uh, fell off the roof into the, into the th trough underground, it's all by gravity, so no energy involved again, it's all passive, and then it's pumped up by a solar pump and a solar panel up to 36 feet, because this is the height that you need to produce the amount of PSI to run a drip irrigation into the greenhouse. So again, it's, it's educational, so in the future when kids will come and see the farm, <coughs> you know, they will follow the rust metal and, and figure it out, you know, where the wet water goes, so it goes roof on the ground, up and into the plants. So again, this is another question that was for our students always. So this is a teaching tool. So on top of designing, it, uh, building a perform well that use just water, uh, sorry, rain and um, air, you also have to think about how it will be used. And uh, this uh, is much, uh, this project is as much as a cultural project as an architectural project and agriculture project. So. Now our students have a chef who cook for them, and I know for, for maybe you all it doesn't sound anything special, but in a place like this, it's a big goal. Our students don't know, you know, that a potato is a grow underground, for example. I mean, it's just the very basic. So having somebody who, who show them how to cook from scratch, it's very important. They also start to enjoy the, um, the cultural part of eating in terms of the social aspect of it. And, and it's another opportunity for us to talk about how much being local is important, whether you are cooking a soup or you are building your um, firehouse or town hall. Uh, the project has been the, the biggest impact of this project outside our own community, so our own students, uh, has been a farmer's market that the local community actually asked us to build for them. It's the first farmer's market in town, in the biggest town near to the rural studio. It's a town of 4,000 people. So we started you know, talking to them. They asked what they needed. And we talk, we talk a lot about how to inform the community that this was going to happen soon. So murals is a strategy. You know, Little gadgets is a strategy. Uh, flyers, but also go and talk to the kids. They, they will then go and talk to their parents. But it's not just that you go to school and say, hey kids, then you're gonna have tomato, so tomato in, the, in, in the square next, next week. It doesn't mean anything to them. So actually we ask them to contribute to the project with some posters. So we brought vegetables, they draw them, and so they went back home and um, announced what was coming. And then we built those stands that are portable so they can be carried by a truck because uh, institutions like, like farmer's market are not really very well established institutions, so they're very frugal, so they don't own the land. So they need to be, to rely on generosity of people letting them use their land. So we already actually moved it twice, so it, it proved that we were right to build them based on the, on the dimension of a, <coughs> of a truck. They are fully uh, built of cedar, and uh, so the treaty wood is only on the structure, so wherever the food touches the, the wood, it's actually, you know, healthy. Uh, we're very proud of this project because it, it ended up being uh, a public space that all parts of the community uh, enjoy. So, you know, we have Midianites in the community, we have black folks, white folks, elders, the young, everybody enjoy this place. And again, you know, we can't take for granted those, those results in these parts. It's a project for the area where we live, but it's also a project that can be exported in the, in the region. So we hope that uh, um, some prototypes will also inspire other uh, groups like farmers, for example, or urban farms. This was built for an urban farm in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, this is a washing station, and this is an a enclosable stand. So the idea is to support or, um, organizations that are trying 
to proceed this idea of uh, eating of eating food of uh, small scale uh, systems. So hopefully everybody will pick the right hand side of the slides from now on. Eat more as a locavore. And uh, just to, to leave you uh, for, for your evening, um, to know that this book is actually a translation of what you just heard today. We cut off all the f, f words. <coughs> and we try to get out of the <coughs> Italian words. But this is kind of, uh, so if you, if you miss something today, you probably will find it here. It's a, it's a book that is written in the way that we speak, so it's very easy. But it tried to transmit this learning process based on learning by observing, learning by designing, learning by building. So, and then it has a, a great collection of examples of the projects. There are drawings, and we speak about the, the design process in it. So if that's en not enough, you are all welcome to come and visit us. So just take uh, three planes, and you'll get to Alabama. <laughs> Thank you.